Today marks 39 years since black consciousness movement leader Steve Biko died in police detention. On Friday, the Steve Biko Foundation hosted the 17th annual lecture, which was addressed by Professor Angela Davis. To reflect on the lecture and Biko's life and legacy, we speak to Willie Lynn Klapo, the iconic leader's friend. Mr. Klapo, thank you so much for coming thank in to speak to us today. Very few of us had, the, had a knowledge, a personal knowledge like you had uh, of Steve Biko. What was he like? Like as a man? Very sharp, very bright, a normal young person uh, at his age, medical student, but profound knowledge of just about anything. He read books, engaged people, uh, and worked very hard. Well, what, and under what conditions did you find out about his death? Well, uh, unfortunately, I was in the camps uh, in Angola at the time of his death. And uh, I had to address the detachment just to explain to them who Steve Pico was and what it meant mm -hmm. to me personally. As somebody that I've known very closely and worked with. Oh. Uh, just for them to be able to understand where they came from what 2016 meant and what efforts he had put into place to organize young people, mm. including students. Uh, so by the time June 16 came, those students were organized and ripe as young people. And that's part of the work that he had done. That was part of his passion. You know, it's, it's very important that you, you speak about him in terms of this because much of the Angela Davis lecture was, was, was framed around the youth of the country. Uh, but she, she said something interesting, young activists of today stand on our shoulders and see what we've seen and more, but we do not provide a steady foundation. Is, is it possible that previous generations of activists have let the current generation of youth down somehow? To some extent, yes, and that's how the youth feel today. Uh, and part of the reason is that, and, and she explained this, that we seem to be satisfied with what we have done. Mm. That we've gone there, we've done certain things, got involved in all the activities that we're involved in, and finished business. And then the youth today are finishing what we had left, the gap that is still remaining, in terms of what we should have done. So I think she was correct. It's part of our responsibility, those of us who are still here and alive, uh, to be able to interact and engage the youth and understand their issues. And she was correct also to say that let them make mistakes. We should not criticize them. We should not be too harsh on them. Let's understand that we're also youth at some point and we've also made some mistakes. Uh, and of course, we need to correct that. She, she, she was particularly shocked by what she called such militaristic responses to people's protest, and speaking specifically about the student protests, I would think. How do you think Steve Biko himself would have responded to the handling of youth anger and, and even generally, more generally, governance in, in the present day in the country? You, you know, what Angela was saying, she was talking about, in general, the response to protests, but she was specific. Mm -hmm. In, in her own way. So I was talking about what happened at Lutule House. That 22 years into democracy would not have expected a militaristic response to genuine concerns by young people. That's the gap that she was talking about. But I think she was also correct that in general, uh, what is happening at our universities, the response to political issues. When people raise political issues, you engage them. The police should be the last uh, to come in. Because once you start calling the police, when no crime has been committed, they're inviting trouble. And I am definitely sure that if Steve Biko was alive, one of the things you would be able to do is to identify the students and say, who is leading? But what are the issues? How can we help? Uh, how do we then begin to address these issues in a manner uh, that will help to address the core of the problem and to find solutions? 
But, but there's so many of Steve Biko's contemporaries currently in power. Why are they unable to do that, do you think? You know, uh, I met a lot of them on Friday. And this is what we're talking about. That we're coming here, we're listening to Angela Tezis, we're listening to what she's saying. We know what Steve Biko thought, uh, we're with him. Uh, but today, there are certain things that are happening. We seem to be paralyzed somehow because we're dispersed. And one of the things that is strong points was the unity of the liberation forces, currently dispersed. And therefore, everybody does anything in their little corners, and there's no concerted effort to be able to say, let's have an informed, organized response to the challenges that we're facing. That is how Steve would have responded to this. Is it because those very contemporaries of Steve Biko have lost their way, have lost perhaps their moral fiber, now that they've tasted power, now that they've tasted wealth as well? But there are very few of them, by the way, who are in government and who have tasted wealth, as we are saying. A lot of them, they're still who they were, uh, in between, uh, trying to do whatever they can uh, under the circumstances. Uh, yes, it's true that some of them are drunk with power. Uh, they believe that everything begins and ends with them. The politics of patronage and corruption and all of those things. Uh, so. For them, everything is about them. They've forgotten about what we're committing ourselves to, that we want to serve the people of South Africa. As we're saying then as students, that we're black first before we're students. That's why the issues that we're raising have to do with the society from which we came from, the communities from which we came from. That's what shaped our thinking and ideas. And that's why the regime was very brutal. Because we're beginning to raise political issues beyond student concerns. I'd love to speak to you more, but thank you so much for your insight into that story. Very personal one as well. Thank you very much for coming in, Mr. Ntlapo.